think we'll get started um, with the uh, afternoon session. Um, the uh, next talk is going to be delivered by Chris Calderon from Toronto about cardioplegia. Um, the reason I thought about having Chris give this talk was we recently went through an experience at our hospital where um, we had used the same cardioplegia for probably 20 years uh, from when Gus had started with us. And all of a sudden, the pharmacy announced that uh, one of our key ingredients, they were no longer manufacturing. So we had to uh, change our cardioplegia solution, which, uh, you know, I think is uh, an anathema to most uh, pediatric cardiac surgeons. You know, once you get used to a solution, you want to keep it. But we changed to uh, the Del Nido solution, uh, and we actually uh, like it better. So our cross clamp times are shorter, and we go a lot longer time in between bleach doses. And uh, at about the same time that we had to change our cardioplegia, uh, I saw that Chris had put this uh, – questionnaire out uh, to surgeons about cardioplegia and uh, figured that the answers would be uh, very interesting to those of us here. And uh, uh, Chris, uh, talk to us about cardioplegia. What, sh what should we be using? How much? How often? And should we all be standardized? That'll, that'll never happen, of course. But uh, Thanks, Carl. And uh, thanks for the invitation to uh, speak today. And uh, I have to say my compliments to Frank Hanley. Uh, I don't know if he's here for that last talk. That was a terrific, uh, terrific discussion about very specific details with regard to surgical technique. I think this talk might be a little bit different. It's going to be a little bit more general. And I'm going to take a bit of a contrarian view uh, and perhaps be a bit nihilistic. Uh, so we'll see how this, uh, how this goes. I don't have any disclosures to make. I don't think that I'd have a tough time convincing you that we've had steady improvement in surgical results over the last few decades, and we credit this to better ICU practices, better management of cardiopulmonary bypass, and uh, better myocardial protection. But I challenge you to actually define how much of this steady improvement is due to a contribution from better myocardial protection. Cardioplegia is good to study, but it's hard to translate. It's very amenable to large animal models. Myocardial performance can be very precisely measured, and early outcomes can be evaluated in a large animal model. And we can even correlate it with myocardial samples, and that's all very useful. But it's very difficult in the lab to get any assessment of late outcomes. They're difficult to measure. Uh, almost any lab study rarely ever goes more than six hours in terms of assessing postoperative function, and that's when you need to know how your patient's going to be in the ICU. And they very rarely assess myocardial function days, weeks, years after cardioplegic arrest, and that's important to know for our patients. Not only that, there's a limitation in terms of what we glean from the laboratory world. They're typically healthy hearts. What about pathologic hearts? What about hearts with who are going to have cyanosis uh, after the cardioplegic arrest. What about neonatal models? These are all less commonly used, but nevertheless, this is the foundation on which we've based our cardioplegia strategies. So we know a lot about normal adult hearts within a few hours of arrest, but we need to know about abnormal hearts and neonates and infants for minutes, hours, days, and weeks after cardioplegic arrest. So. Carl, you've given me this objective to answer this question, what type and how much. That's going to be a tough question to answer. But I like to approach it with an outline that looks like this. First, I would like to do a kind of quick overview of what we know from randomized controlled trials looking at cardioplegic arrest. And then how, has, how have these randomized controlled trials been translated into current practice? Seems straightforward. So to start uh, preparation, I did a literature search and searched the word cardioplegia, 4,000 entries, limited to children less than 0 to 18 years of age, 330 entries, limited to English text and humans, 224, limited to randomized, we're down to 23. Then I reviewed the 23 entries, and there were only 11 studies, two of which were actually multiple publications off the same randomized cohort. So there isn't a lot of, uh, there isn't a huge body of literature out there with regard to randomized trials looking at cardioplegia technique. But uh, because we have uh, uh, some time together, why don't we do a quick overview of what those 11 studies are. So now you can 
put in your mind that you've reviewed every randomized control trial with regard to cardioplegic arrest. Here we go, rapid review. These will all be in the same format and we'll go over them pretty quickly. First, study by Young et al. And these are in a chronologic order starting from the uh, more distant past. And I will apologize if my search technique somehow missed some, somebody's trial. Um, the design, 138 patients looking at cold crystalloid, co sorry, cold blood versus crystalloid. For outcome measures, they were looking at inotropes, function, complications, length of stay, 30-day survival, and they found cold blood had less uh, intraoperative inotrope requirements, uh, but all the other parameters, no difference. Conclusion, uh, uh, the aortic cross-clamp time predicts outcomes, uh, but more it had a greater effect than cardioplegia. Next one, 50 patients, cold blood cardioplegia, plus or minus leukocyte depletion. Uh, the outcomes, leukocyte depletion had evidence of less inflammation markers, less peak creatinine kinase, less catecholamines after surgery. Conclusion, leukocyte depletion has a clinical benefit. Another one, 40 patients, uh, about 24 months of age, not cyanotic patients, crystalloid versus cold blood. The outcome, cold blood pa patients who had cold blood cardioplegia had a less drop in ATP at reperfusion, and this effect was greater in infants. Less troponin release up to 48 hours, and this effect was greater in infants. So the conclusion, cold blood has a protective effect which is greatest in infants if you want to protect yourself against a troponin release. 103 patients, some of these were cyanotic. Cold blood versus cold blood in a hot shot. The outcome, uh, more spontaneous defibrillation with a hot shot, higher lactate extraction, lower troponin T and fatty acid binding protein at 18 hours. Conclusion, hot shot enhances protection. Next one. Uh, 134 patients looking at three, a three-way randomization scheme to look at high K, high K with adenosine and lidocaine or low K. The conclusion, there's better myopreservation with low potassium, adenosine, and lidocaine. I think you're starting to see a pattern here. There's quite a variety of, uh, of uh, 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 designs testing various different parameters, and there's no clear pattern, and that's why it's tiresome to listen to. And all the outcomes are very soft in terms of uh, clinical benefit. Uh, this one, AVSD patients, cold blood versus plegisol, transient benefit with blood cardioplegia, but it was limited to the early uh, intraoperative assessment. Uh, this one, uh, the uh, 30 patients, crystalloid versus blood, different substrate metabolism when they looked at uh, samples of the myocardium, but there was no clinical difference in the groups. Uh, almost done, two, two studies done on this cohort, crystalloid with St. Thomas versus crystalloid blood versus cold blood in a hot shot. Um, in the outcomes, uh, there were, in the cyanotic patients, there was a little less deficit when comparing the uh, uh, cold blood and hot shot versus crystalloid, and there were higher myocardial free amino acids. Uh, the conclusion, older non-cyanotic patients with short cross-clamp times, it really doesn't matter what you do. Cold blood hotshot has a benefit in cyanotic young patients with long cross-clamp times, at least in terms of the parameters that were measured. This one, uh, 47 patients uh, looked at mild hypothermia and cold crystalloid cardioplegia versus normothermia and intermittent warm blood cardioplegia. Uh, the, uh, there were some Small differences in ATP time profiles, but no difference by the time the end of the testing interval. Uh, there is a not inferior conclusion. And this is the last one, cold blood with high K versus low K. Uh, they did, uh, they looked at uh, inotropes, ICU time length of stay, there are no differences. There was some difference in long-term ventilation and troponin scores in the low K group. Conclusion, better preservation with low K. All right, now you've done it. You've reviewed every randomized trial that we can use to help guide, uh, to help answer the question that Carl brought up, uh, what type and how much. And I don't think you can draw a conclusion from that rapid survey of the available data. What do we know from randomized control trials? It's difficult to see a consistent pattern. There's publication bias that may be present in selecting some of these studies. 
there's certainly a wide variety of testable variables, and it really precludes randomized controlled trials as a practical tool to identify the optimum management. So what alternatives do we have? We have observational trials. We have animal studies, perhaps with better models, pathologic models, cyanotic models, neonates, longer follow-up. And then we have something that I think you may find interesting, aggregate clinical wisdom. So what can we say about aggregate clinical wisdom? Somehow, despite the lack of randomized controlled trials guiding us, we've gotten better. And there's a, a, a body of uh, social science out there that suggests that large populations actually can recognize complex patterns and uh, these large populations are essentially an aggregate and the recognition of complex patterns has been described as wisdom and this is, a, this is a science and a social science. If we look at this data, this is a group, uh, this is an electronic market that uh, markets uh, uh, um, securities based on the likelihood of uh, someone w winning a presidential election. And there are many, many people here who uh, bid for these uh, futures, essentially. And they integrate data from various sources, press releases, reading the newspaper, talking to their neighbor. I don't know what they do, but as a population, with time, they get better and better at predicting who's going to win the election um, down to uh, within a, a percent or two in terms of accuracy. Look at this plot. This plot could be pulled out of any one of those scientific studies that I just showed you. Let's assume that it shows an assessment of cardioplegic efficacy. On the vertical axis, we could imagine there's myocardial performance. And on the horizontal axis, we could imagine that it's surgeon's estimate of efficacy based on reading uh, publications, talking to their colleagues, uh, wherever they get their information from. But that's actually not what this slide shows. This sli slide shows the Hollywood Stock Exchange where uh, people bid on their uh, guess as to the opening weekend box office take for a movie. On the horizontal axis is actually the forecasted opening take by this market. And on the horizontal axis is what the actual opening take is. The point is, large groups of people uh, assimilate data in very, very uh, in multiple formats, perhaps publications, perhaps talking to their colleagues, perhaps uh, just pondering it, Brownian motion. I'm not sure how it happens, but they're actually very good at predicting uh, the uh, uh, my performance of whatever it is they're looking at. So I wonder if that hasn't actually been helping us to get better in terms of our uh, myocardial practice strategies. Well, have we figured it out as a group? Well, one way to look at that would be to look at what we do in clinical practice. If little theory there was correct, we'd all be doing the same thing. So uh, we uh, put together a survey that Carl described and uh, we wanted to see what is it that we do in clinical practice as a community. So there's a working group facilitated by the CHSS and uh, the members of this working group are here and we designed a survey. We sent it to 122 surgeons in North America and got responses from about half of them. Let's see what we actually do. In the survey, we, uh, we wanted to look at the uh, way people may differ in terms of their myocardial preservation strategies based on age. So we broke it up into four age groups, neonates, infants, children, and adolescents. And in the survey, we suggested a specific operation in order to uh, keep the operation uh, complex in terms of likely requiring a long cross clamp time, but simple in that uh, uh, sorry circulatory rest was not likely to be required and uh, unusual coronary perfusion techniques were not likely to be required. So we had these scenarios, truncus arteriosus, tetralogy, mitral valve repair, mitral valve replacement, in order to kind of standardize the assessments. And this is what we found. We look at the uh, type of cardioplegia by age. Uh, the uh, neonates, infants, children, and adolescents were all the same. Uh, there wasn't an age-specific difference in the way people manage their cardioplegia. T 
tachycardia by solution, the majority of uh, uh, respondents used the Del Nido type cardioplegia solution, and that was followed closely by the ones using customized solutions. And we had to lump these together because there's really quite a large number of uh, homegrown recipes for cardioplegia. Uh, less common were the custodial uh, St. Thomas type uh, solution and uh, microplegia types. The type of solution really didn't vary by age. Uh, the details aren't important here, except you can see the pattern is very similar. In other words, people use the, tend to use the same cardioplegia for all age patients. And cardioplegia temperature management strategy was pretty much the same across the different age groups. The majority uh, have cold, use cold cardioplegia less than 5 degrees centigrade, uh, and 5 to 10, uh, those two combinations took up about 80% of the uh, groups. If we look at the cardioplegia temperature by solution, there really wasn't much difference here either. The average temperature was between 6 and 10 degrees. Uh, and that did not vary much between solutions. In terms of how much we cool the patient, uh, that also that did tend to vary a bit by age. And you can see the neonates tended to be uh, brought down to cooler temperatures than the infants, children, and adolescents. Um, and the systemic temperature by solution, again, was pretty much the same. Uh, the average temperature was about 26 degrees. And it, you can see the relative breakdown for the different uh, types of solutions. Uh, was topical cooling used? Is about 60% uh, of the time uh, uh, surgeons use topical cooling, and that did not seem to vary by age. Uh, and uh, in terms of the uh, solutions, uh, I think it's roughly 60-40 for all the groups, although the microplegia uh, seemed like uh, people did not use any topical subset. In terms of hot shots, uh, the uh, only a minority of surgeons use a hot shot, and that was consistent across the different age groups. Uh, almost everyone uh, responding used anti-grade cardioplegia. Occasionally, it was a combination of anti-grade and retrograde cardioplegia. Uh, it, that did not vary by age, and none of the respondents used uh, solely retrograde cardioplegia. Uh, in terms of the induction dose, uh, the uh, induction dose tended to be about 25 to 30, 35 cc's per kilo, which is the upper blue bars. Uh, we can skip that one. And the maintenance doses uh, tended to be uh, in the uh, 10, c 10 cc's per kilo or 15 cc's per kilo, which are the middle two bars, the uh, pink and the uh, This is, the, this is the slide that I was actually most interested in, was the time intervals between doses. And uh, the uh, majority, uh, this did not vary much between uh, the different age groups. And the majority of surgeons uh, tended to stay between, sorry, keep going with the mouse here, mouse paralysis, uh, 20 to 25 cc, uh, sorry, 20 to 25 minutes, 30, 35 minutes is all shown right in here. Uh, there was a, uh, maybe about a third of the surgeons actually went beyond 40 minutes. And uh, this, this blue bar represents uh, surgeons who said they use a single dose regardless of uh, the duration. When we broke that down by solution, and this is probably the most interesting slide of the survey, the, uh, this is the Del Nido solution which uh, tended to average about 45 minutes uh, between doses and uh, had a wide variety uh, extending from 20 minutes up to 60 minutes. Four of these surgeons actually give one dose no matter how long the operation takes. And that was, uh, so it, it suggested that the surgeons using the Del Nido solution felt the most comfortable in terms of having a long interval between doses. All the other uh, uh, solutions other than the custodial were around pretty religiously around 20 minutes between doses. So in terms of what we do, most uh, surgeons use blood-based cardioplegia. Age does not seem to be important. A large proportion use the Del Nido or some customized type solution. And uh, the Del Nido and custodial type solutions are definitely associated with longer time intervals. 
Uh, about 20% of surgeons use a single dose regardless of duration. Uh, there's a wide variety of solutions, uh, but there's very little variety in technique. And I think the greatest variability among surgeons actually has to do with the time interval between doses. And that was the one thing I most wanted to know about. So in terms of inferences, I think if we were to assume that current myopreservation is clinically satisfactory for all surgeons, and that's a big if, then a large proportion of surgeons can safely extend the intervals between cardioplegia doses by simply following the lead of the surgeons who are using the Del Nido solution, and maybe we can all extend up to 60 minutes uh, with uh, impunity. Uh, it also suggests, if we are all having satisfactory myocardial preservation, that there's little difference between solutions, and there's equipoise to test different regimens in a prospective fashion. So the question originally posed was what type and how much? Well, I think we're going to have a little trouble actually answering this question if we want to do it in a rigorous scientific fashion. We may be forced to rely on this concept of aggregate clinical wisdom where we all, through Brownian motion, just kind of drift uh, and uh, we're all satisfied with our results. We could integrate basic science, we can integrate large animal studies, observational clinical studies, and occasional RCTs. We, we can do that as a community. But if we don't want to do that, if we said, well, we actually want to solve this problem, we actually want to all be 100% sure that our myopreservation strategies are absolutely as optimal as they can be, well, then we would have to do something different than what we have been doing in the past. One approach might be we could have a large observational trial. We could leverage the fact that we all do different things, register all our patients and track them. Of course, we'd have to agree upon some outcome measure that was clinically relevant. Perhaps it'd be an echocardiogram at 24 hours or whatever we were to choose. We can use statistics to control for the variability between these different uh, uh, techniques, and we can control for the many, many variables involved, and we could, we could maybe arrive at some solution, uh, some answer that would identify the optimum strategy. Alternatively, we could say, no, 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 RCTs are the way we solve a problem, but the current approach that we've used as a community where individuals embark upon a single randomized controlled trial to test the, the uh, uh, validity of their uh, institution's beliefs, it's not going to work. We're never going to get anywhere. If we really wanted to do that, I'd say we have to adopt the adopt a, uh, a strategy like March Madness. Let's run 16 trials simultaneously, and then take the champions of those uh, in uh, those uh, trials. And we'd have eight champions, and and run them in the semifinals and finals. And as a community, within five years, we could probably come with an answer. That identified the best strategy among the 16 entrants that we chose when we started. We could do that as a community, too. Uh, but if we don't do that, then I think we're going to rely on aggregate clinical wisdom, which has served us well so far. Uh, I'm just not sure that it's as good as it could be. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chris. I was really looking forward to seeing the results of that uh, survey. Uh, and I like your analogy about the aggregate wisdom. I think it reminds me a little bit about when we did the Aristotle score and decided, you know, we're not going to look at data, we're just going to look at the impressions that a lot of experts have. So uh, I can tell you from our experience with switching to the Del Nido, we initially probably gave it too often and then it took a long time for the heart to wake up. And now when I'm at like 40, 45 minutes, I try not to give another dose because then it's going to take that much longer for the heart to wake up after we take the clamp off. Uh, Chuck Frazier. Chris, thanks for that excellent review and sort of provocative theorizing. I, I, I might pose a practical opportunity that it could have a double benefit. So cardioplegia is not the only place where preservation solutions are used in surgery, kidney transplant, liver transplant. So I know for a fact that Carl Backer has come and harvested hearts at Texas Children's. I know for a fact that I've gone to Chicago to his hospital to pick up a heart. Some of this borders on ridiculous in our community, and it might be an opportunity um, 
to think collectively in, in pediatric cardiac transplantation about <clears throat> a standardized approach to myocardial preservation, and then also leverage the community of people that are more than qualified to regionally procure hearts, minimize the risk of tra uh, transporting teams across the country, and uh, all the logistical challenge that all of us who do transplants face. And it's weird if we couldn't do something like that, what you think? Well, having been involved occasionally in a harvest like that, it is a wonderful experience. Uh, to, we've been on the shipping end and on the receiving end, and it works out great both ways, no question. We can do a lot as a community if we just are willing to decide on some specific uh, protocol, like choosing the myocardial preservation solution we want to use. And as we had said in one of the meetings earlier, in the absence of clarity, at least be consistent. And we could just choose one and go with it. As long as we're consistent, it would work. Microphone two. Hi, Jorge Molina. I work for Dr. Nikairo. I'm his PA. In the early 80s, uh, we were using plegiazol and multi-dose in one-to-one -one and four-to-one bug birds. Then in the early 2000s, we went to the, uh, Dr. Rebecca's formula, which ischemic times up to 90 minutes. Then we moved to the Delito formula up to about two hours. Then we switched to custodial. When we found, we were able to try all three up to 203 minutes. And the adults are going up to over 200 minutes in the United States in adults. I think custodial was first used in 1964, modified in 78. It has a good track record, I think. Thank you. Uh, so if we had this March Madness type protocol where we pick 16 management strategies, perhaps that would be one of them, although you described four of them. So we got four entrants already and then have a runoff and tournament of all time. I don't know. Jake, Jake was. That was a, a great uh, talk and a, a nice uh, comprehensive survey of the literature. In your survey, Chris, did, did you, uh, I can't remember, I feel, I'm, I'm sure I was one of the people who filled it out. Um, did you ask us if we would be willing to engage in some sort of a trial? Ours is a very small community, as we learn all the time when we come to one of these meetings and everything's targeted at the adults and the general thoracic guys, but at least in the, in the, uh, in the hall where the people are selling stuff. I am a firm believer in Del Nido solution that's just belief, um, and I think you've persuaded me that it is just belief, and everybody else seems to be getting fairly equivalent results. Did, did people say they'd participate, and Carl, could you take a survey in the room here and see if people would participate in some sort of a trial? I mean, we, we certainly would be at, at Duke willing to do that. Who, who, who would be willing to participate in a uh, cardioplegia trial? Looks like everybody. And then I'll, I'll ask another question. How many people after listening to this are going to go home and maybe change what they're doing? We got one hand. Anybody else? I'm, I'm going to extend my time intervals a bit. I feel well, a little I, more comfortable I, doing I, that. I've been a religious 20-minute guy, and, well, the community's showing me that maybe I don't need to be quite so religious about yeah, it. We, we were 20 minutes, and then when we started Del Nido, we said, well, well, we'll do 30. And then we had a couple of occasions where we went up to 40 and nothing happened, and then 45 and nothing happened. And now, uh, I mean, we just go 45 minutes. And it really, it, you can get a lot more done if you don't have to stop and give cardioplegia every uh, two minutes. Marshall, you have a very loud voice, so you don't need the microphone. That's, he actually beat me to the punch. Uh, I was going to ask that we have a secondary survey. Among the people who said they would participate in the trial, how many think it's worth it? How many think it's worth the trouble? Because it could, if everybody feels like they have satisfactory myocardial preservation and there's no room to improve, then it's never going to happen. If, on the other hand, people say, well, you know, I'd, I'd like to not have to think about it at all. I would like the heart leaving the OR to be absolutely as good as it came in. And if that's achievable, then a trial like this is worthwhile because we haven't reached that point. I mean, clearly the holy grail is one dose of cardioplegia and normal function at the end of the case. And I actually think Del Nido comes pretty close to that. Let's take two quick questions. But can we ask, though, how many people sure. think it would actually be worth doing some randomized trials? Because that's a little different question. I'm not so sure. Not as many yeses. Okay. 
Asma Arati from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. Thank you, Chris. That was a very nice presentation. I, I was trained by you guys to use blood cardiology all the time, at, at every 20 minutes, and I've over the last couple of years switched almost exclusively to custod custodial, and I've been comfortable using it up to two and a half hours with one shot. So, but that aside, if we were to go through what you what you propose, the March Madness of trials, the most important question would be what would be the surrogate or clinical out outcome to use and if if we were able to convince a lot of people to use the same surrogate or clinical outcome I think it would be most useful well, I, I think you're right the only way that could work is if we had a endpoint that we thought was clinically relevant and so you know troponin leak I mean it, it's you know everybody's against troponin leaks but it's not going to be the end point that's going to make us change. I think my, my sense is the only thing that's going to make us change is going to be uh, uh, some kind of uh, core lab assessment of myocardial function. It, it's not going to be mortality, it's, or it's going to be some composite uh, length of stay in the ICU and that sort of thing. It's a tough thing to measure. Very quick. Yes. Um, I think that's a very important question about whether this would be worth it. I think it it will be worth it because if you can give one dose when you're doing an arterial switch in the neonate versus having to give 20 every 20 minutes give a selective coronary perfusion down into those coronaries, I think that could potentially impact cross clamp time. It could potentially impact technical ease with which you would get the operation done. How many people doing an arterial switch operation now use just one dose of bleach? I'm going to give multiple doses during the switch. See, I, I, I want to join the other group and just join the one. other group. You'll be fine. You're going to be fine. <laughs> Make the leap. Anyway, that's why it's really helpful to see what everyone else does. Are any of the surgeons here that use just one dose routinely with Del Nido that answer that survey? So Jim Quinicenza, got a couple, yeah, we got some, we got some big names out here that are. Well, this is aggregate clinical wisdom happening right before our eyes. All right, that's the point of these whole, these meetings. So, okay, thanks very much, Chris. All right. Our next presentation is from our local host, Dr. Overman, who's actually responsible for the weather here in Minneapolis, I understand.